buried in the granite hills of Bihar, India, is a fascinating mystery that pushes the limits of what we know about ancient engineering, sound design, and human skill. These are the Barabar and Nagarjuni Caves, carved more than 2,300 years ago, according to mainstream archaeology, and attributed to Emperor Ashoka of the Mauryan dynasty. But behind the conventional inscriptions lies something extraordinary. These caves are not simple rain shelters, as history textbooks might suggest. They are geometric marvels carved with extreme precision into some of the hardest stone on Earth, granite. Let's begin with the material. Granite is notoriously difficult to shape, even with modern tools. Yet the inner walls of these chambers are not just smooth, they're polished to a mirror-like sheen. A roughness tester, a device used to assess the finish of surfaces down to the micrometer level, shows values in these caves that rival, and in some cases surpass, those found in industrially polished slabs of granite used today. One chamber, Sudama, records a roughness level comparable to window glass. These aren't the product of primitive chiseling. This is industrial level finishing. And the best part? The polish is found on curved walls and vaulted ceilings, not just flat surfaces. Anyone in modern masonry knows. Polishing vertically or above head level, inside a confined space of solid rock, without room for error, is next to impossible without advanced planning and tools. Then there's the geometry. Modern 3D scans performed by engineers have revealed astonishing symmetries. These aren't random hollows in rock. The caves exhibit near-perfect bilateral symmetry, precise right angles, and radiused curves formed by arcs of exact dimensions. In Gopa, Vapa, and Karanchopar, over 60% of all scanned data points fall within 2.5 millimeters of symmetry, across millions of measured points. One chamber even features fused sections of different spherical radii, mirrored perfectly across a central axis. In another, the vaulted ceiling is a precise cylindrical arc, not just roughly curved, but mathematically intentional. These are not artistic flourishes, their engineering blueprints come to life. What's more, the chambers seem to have been designed with precise volume ratios in mind. For instance, the ratio of interior space between Vapa and Vaka is exactly 8 to 7. Between Karan Chapar and Gopa, it's 2 to 3. In Sudama, the dome's volume is 5 twelfths of the larger hall it adjoins. These are whole number relationships, a sign of deliberate planning. To achieve this, ancient engineers would have had to understand not just Euclidean geometry, but volumetric calculation involving spheres, cylinders, and cones. You can't stumble into such ratios while hacking rock. You have to calculate them ahead of time and execute with exacting discipline. And there's more. The builders appear to have used a unit of measurement now referred to as the Barabar Yard, roughly 85.5 centimeters. This unit appears consistently across floor plans, heights, and chamber dimensions. But strangely, some chambers also align perfectly with metric values. For instance, Sudama's dome radius is exactly 3 meters, and its central axis rises precisely 1 meter above the floor. The idea that metric dimensions were used more than two millennia ago suggests an understanding of Earth-based calculations, because the modern meter is based on the circumference of the planet. Could this be a coincidence? Or have we as a modern civilization simply rediscovered a standard that was already known to our ancestors? Now we turn to acoustics. These chambers don't just look strange, they sound strange. In Sudama, sound lingers for over 60 seconds. In Lomas Rishi, low frequency reverberation hits 70 seconds. These echo chambers make speech unintelligible after just a short distance. Balloons popped at the center of the domes created powerful standing waves, with specific frequencies being amplified dramatically. Most surprising of all, multiple chambers with very different shapes and sizes were found to resonate at almost the exact same bass frequency, around 34.4 Hz. That's not something that happens by accident. Acoustic engineers today would struggle to achieve that kind of frequency tuning across multiple rooms carved in solid stone. So how are they made? The conventional story says these caves were constructed during Ashoka's 28-year reign and donated to the Ajivaka sect. But the inscriptions, while authentic, only mention donations, not construction. The quality of the inscriptions is crude compared to the refined chambers. In some cases, the names of the original recipients were scratched out and replaced. It's entirely plausible that the caves were inherited reused structures from an earlier time whose original function had already been forgotten. Even prominent Indologists like Harry Falk admit this is possible. 
Moreover, the notion that these were simply rain shelters collapses under scrutiny. Why carve acoustically tuned, geometrically perfect, mirror-polished granite chambers just to stay dry? Why include vaulted ceilings, angled walls, and perfectly calculated volumes? If the intent was shelter, the caves could have been rough, quick, and utilitarian. But these were not made for comfort. They were made for purpose. One that seems to involve sound, resonance, and a sophisticated understanding of physical space. It's not just speculation. Stonemasons with decades of experience were shown the scan data. Their unanimous verdict? This is a level of craftsmanship that today's stone industry can barely replicate. Even with CNC machines and laser cutters, polishing vertically inside a confined chamber, achieving symmetry across 350 million scanned data points, matching resonance frequencies, for many of these experts, it was simply beyond belief. If Barabar were a one-off, it might be dismissed as a fluke, but the same techniques appear in seven chambers across two sites, Barabar and Nagarjuni. In all of them, the polish, geometry, symmetry, and acoustics persist, and nowhere else in Indian history do we find this level of stone mastery repeated. Not at Ellora, not at Ajanta, not in the later temples of Mahabalipuram or Kajuraho. Even though those sites are artistically magnificent, they lack the geometric discipline and acoustic phenomena of Barabar. Thank you for watching. If you found this journey as fascinating as we did, subscribe to Awakened Epochs for more.